right, thank you guys so much um, for being here and taking time out of your Monday evening um, to speak with us uh, tonight. I'm really excited to be here. And today, um, what I wanted to talk about is the concept of free time, the free time free for all, and how that really plays a pretty big part in success as a young adult. What do you do with yourself when you don't really have anything on your schedule right at the moment? Managing these competing interests and managing your responsibilities and what you need to do versus what you want to do um, can be pretty tricky and that, that's a really important skill and it's something that we stress at CLE. So that is what I am going to be talking about um, today. So just to start off, a little bit about CLE for those of you who may not be um, familiar with what we do. We are a post-secondary transition program. We have two locations in the state of California. One is in Costa Mesa, the other is up north in Monterey. Um, and we offer the same services at both locations as well as our um, four other locations across the country, soon to be five. We are opening in Nashville, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we provide support in four main areas, academics, career development, social development, and independent living skills. And by weaving these four areas um, together, students receive anywhere from 20 to 30 hours of direct support from us in these areas while they are living in their own apartments, um, usually with a roommate, um, and we support all of those skills to help them um, go to school if they want to, or pursue a career, or both. Um, we have students who kind of mix it up, so that's fine too. Um, so I would encourage, um, if anybody would like to talk further, I'm certainly happy to do that in a separate conversation um, about our, our center in Costa Mesa and what we're doing there. Um, so some really exciting stuff, despite COVID and despite everything that's going on, um, our students are still making amazing strides in independence. Most of them did not um, go home during the quarantine. They stayed in their apartments, which was really great. So they were able to keep working on those independent skills and um, keep their, um, you know, their roommates and kind of keep their familiarity, those routines going, um, which really helped them feel stable. Okay. So just to, to start off um, talking today about this topic of, of free time and, and what we do with our time, um, let's think about it in the lens of quarantine 2020. Um, so what did you, when, when this all happened, right, like what did a lot of people say that they were going to do? What were they going to accomplish? A lot of things were going to be accomplished, right? You were going to... Or, Okay, this is my list, right? This is, this is, these are the things I said, wow, there's gonna be a lot of time at home. These are all things that I can totally do during this time, right? I'm gonna have a spotless home. I'm gonna learn a new language be, just because, why not? Um, I'm going to bake. I'm gonna get crafty. Things are going to be, you know, bedazzled in my house. The kids will not only be caught up on their schoolwork, but they will be ahead because I will be sitting with them every night. Um, and we will be discussing academics and, and you know, literature. Um, you know, I said to myself, well, this is great. I'll work out every day. Everything will be organized perfectly. I mean, why not, right? I have a lot of time here. Now, can anybody else relate to that? Like, did anybody have, like, these kinds of ideas of what they were going to do with this time that we were all at home? Um, I hope I'm not the only one came up with this crazy list. Um, okay, like what was the reality, right? We all had a lot of time at home, but how many of those things got accomplished? I'll tell you, zero. Zero of those things actually happened. Now, I would make strides here and there. I might have a day where I felt like I was really productive. I may have taken a couple of online lessons to brush up on my French. I didn't really get anywhere with that. Um, but the reality of it is that even though I had time on my hands, so to speak, it's not that easy to be productive. It's not that easy to follow a to-do list. It's not that easy to accomplish all the things that, that we say in our minds that we should be able to. Um, so the reality looked a whole lot different um, than, than my list of goals there when all of this started. So it's the same thing for our young adults when they either go away to college in the dorms, if they move into an apartment, whatever their living situation is, they have downtime. 
they're not in class 24 hours, they're not receiving services 24 hours. If they're working or if they have some sort of a part-time gig or whatever, they're not doing that all day either. So they have these breaks. Here on the screen, you'll see this is a sample student schedule at CLE. So this is what somebody's schedule could look like. Um, and it's all color coded for them um, between their classes and, and their social activities and independent living skill instruction, executive functioning. We build time in for that to make sure that they have their routines down. But if you look at this schedule, you'll notice that there's a lot of white space, right? There's white space on there and that is all time that is completely unstructured for our students. So it can get really um, confusing for, for young adults, whether they have exceptionalities or not, honestly, um, in terms of how do I manage this time? How do I keep myself busy, but not so busy that I forget where I need to be in two hours? Or I'm really tired, I want to kind of relax a little bit, but I don't wanna fall asleep and, and uh, miss my next class, or miss my session at the CLE Center, or whatever it is. Um, so, so you'll see here that everybody has to deal with this concept of free time, downtime, um, no matter what their schedule is looking like. Okay, so there is good news and bad news with, with this concept of managing free time. The good news is that it's up to each individual, right? It's individual responsibility to manage their time. But it's a, that's also the bad news. The bad news and the good news are the exact same thing. Individual comes down to individual responsibility and someone managing their time correctly because as young adults they are responsible for their own course in life as much as you as parents might give them guidance programs like CLE might give them guidance and best practices and try to help them create those good habits it's up to the person so this is something that we see a lot with our students and we work a lot with them on this concept of okay you have to take ownership of your life of your time and that means managing this, this issue of needs and wants. Okay, um, so procrastination, like who here procrastinates? Anybody else? Okay, um, I definitely do. I mean, I'm not immune to it, right? Um, so this issue of procrastination is probably something that you've seen throughout your, ch your child's life. I know I see it with my two kids constantly um, and you know it, it snowballs right so it creates so much anxiety and here you can see on the screen there's like a little um, you know it's the circle of life here when it uh, um, with procrastination of hey I have stuff to do I'll do it when I'm done doing this thing and I'm do I'm having a lot of fun I'll, I'll kind of maybe do half of it or a quarter of it or like one thing then I'll go back to doing something else and then it turns into this panic oh my god I've let this go I don't know what to do do and the anxiety actually stops people from being productive at all at that point then they're just they're they're in full-blown panic mode I don't know what to do I feel so guilty I didn't do the right thing I didn't manage my time I'm terrible you know I'll never get this right and then they kind of rush through it as best that they can they feel this overwhelming sense of relief that it's over but then that cycle is going to start again. Um, so one thing that we work with our students a lot on is um, breaking down big tasks into smaller chunks and actually setting time into their schedule in, in a week or in, in over the course of a couple of weeks to work on that. So that way it's just in their schedule. They know that they have to work on one part of one assignment, let's say. Um, so that way um, it's broken down and it's a lot easier to manage. Um, but procrastination is, is a big, big thing, um, to, and, and I'm sure that you've all seen that. So um, when we talk about managing free time, there's a few different um, kind of main themes to think about or to, to talk to your child about, to have them start thinking about, to recognize. Um, we have competing interests, wants versus needs, and then reinforcement. So let's talk a little bit about competing interests. And this is a really, really interesting time um, to be talking about this issue of free time just because, you know, we have been in quarantine for so long. Um, we just kind of started to come out of it. Now they're talking about possibly, I, I, live in the, I live in LA County, so at least LA County is talking about possibly new stay at home orders. Um, so, so this is a really, really unprecedented time 
um, it, when it comes to young adults learning to manage all of this and, and what they need to do when they're pretty much stuck in one place for the majority of their day. Um, so when we think about competing interests, these are some things that your child might be dealing with or, or might be trying to figure out how to manage and how to balance. So they know that they need to do online school meetings, right? That's an expectation that they participate in whatever schedule their school has put forth. But they also really need to maintain connections with friends. Um, they need that for their emotional and mental well-being. Um, they know that they need to attend to personal hygiene, but they may not really want to wake up early. They, they want to make sure that they're getting enough sleep so they don't necessarily have time in the morning to do everything. They know that they need to clean their apartment or their house or wherever they're living, but sometimes that gets really stressful and they know that managing their stress is also important. They need to help themselves, but they also want to help others, whether that's a family member, a roommate, um, society in general, if they wanted to volunteer, if they wanted to be part of something else. Um, so that can be conflicting interests. Um, eating healthy meals or following a diet, you know, kind of a, um, or even an exercise regimen, just kind of trying to be healthy. They may really need to do that, but then they also need to be very mindful of their budget and what they're able to do, um, given the constrictions that we're all operating within. So there are a lot of competing interests here. And you can see here that when people are trying to juggle these ideas, it can be like, oh my gosh, wait, I'm just, I, I don't know, I'm not gonna do anything today because I don't know what to do. Everything seems important yet nothing really seems um, like it's the right thing to do right now. Any questions or comments about that before I move forward? Okay. So wants versus needs. This is another thing that comes into play when, when students, or we call them students at CLE, or young adults um, have a free time or a downtime and they're just hanging out in their apartment. Um, how many of you guys have heard this? For those of you who have children who are gamers, I need to meet this level, mom. I need to beat this level. Hang on. I, I know I have to do my homework, but I need to beat this level. I hear this every day. Um, so is that really a need? No, no, nobody needs to beat a video game level in order to live their life. Um, but for students and young adults, it can be difficult because it feels like it's a need, right? So it, it's, it's really a want though. They want to because it gives them a certain sense of satisfaction. Um, when in reality, they need to do their homework so then they can get good grades. They need to attend to personal hygiene, um, you know, for, for health reasons. They need to actually stop and, and eat a meal um, sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes our students forget to eat because they're in the middle of doing these games or doing a hobby, doing whatever they like to do. Um, so identifying wants, versus needs for students is incredibly important. And sometimes what we do is we sit down with our students and we um, you know, go through their day and kind of like, well, what did you do today? And, and we make a list and we kind of identify what is a want and what is a need? What did you really want to do versus what did you need to do today that maybe didn't get done? Um, so a lot of times our young adults will absolutely say, I need to do this, I need to do that. I need to um, you know, play this game, I need to listen to this music, I need to watch YouTube videos about this topics that I really like, when in reality they don't need to. Um, they may not like to hear that, um, but, but emphasizing what they really do need to do versus what they might want to do um, can help them put it in perspective sometimes. Okay. Um, when we talk about reinforcements, um, what, what works? Um, and this is going to be different for everybody. So as you are helping your child or your family member, somebody that you know, your young adult, to identify reinforcements, um, it, they can come in many different ways. Internal reinforcements, some people are really good with that. Um, some people like external reinforcements. And, um, also known as bribery. Um, <laughs> I am not above bribery myself. Um, so if it works, it works, you know, as long as it's within reason and it works for your family and it's something positive, 
okay, it works. I think that we're all kind of, um, we, we all respond to external reinforcement. Um, it could be short term versus long term. So it could be that they get um, a five minute break after they complete one part of an assignment. Um, so that could be a really short term reinforcement that gives them a chance to breathe, maybe get up, take a short walk, get a glass of water, whatever it is. Or it could be something long term that they're working towards a bigger goal. Um, and then there are positive and negative reinforcements. Now, I know that negative reinforcement is not something that really anybody likes to do, um, you know, and it's not something that's recommended in terms of, the, you know, threats or punishments. If you don't do this, then something not so good is going to happen. Um, generally, we like to stay away from those, but there's plenty of great things um, that can be positive that can serve as reinforcements. So I wanted to take um, a minute here and ask everybody who's on here tonight, if you could just respond through the chat of what are some um, reinforcements that work either for you yourself or for your child, your young adult, um, you know, somebody else that you know. What works that you have found? here if I can see some, some of your answers. So everyone should use the chat and share with Melinda if there's something that's a positive reinforcement that works for you. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's going somewhere. I mean, I will go first and totally admit that I bribed my middle school son um, that if he did everything perfectly in summer, not perfectly, but if he attended every class for summer school and turned in every assignment on, on time complete, that I would get him a VR headset. So it was incredibly motivating. He has not missed one second of class this summer. So it's been awesome. But what else has worked for you guys? We've got money. Feeling better about my health. Trips are outing, bonding times. I know I watch, uh, videos with my son kind of as a positive reinforcement let's get this done and then we can watch bakuman or whatever okay there's some ideas very good thank you everybody for for sharing that that's some really good you know ones that i think that a lot of people use um food milkshakes <laughs> ooh, yes i would do that yes <laughs> I could come for a milkshake. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, guys. So just remember that, um, you know, when, when your child, your student um, does have to make some tough decisions about their day and about how they're spending their time, you know, sometimes a little bit of reinforcement in, the, in a good way that speaks to them um, can be really, really powerful. Here, let me go back here. Okay. So let's talk for a second about motivation versus habits so a lot of times you hear well to do something to get something done to do something appropriately or to be successful um, you have to have the motivation and in thinking about this it sounds really good right it sounds pretty pretty straightforward like yeah i'll just be motivated and i'll get it done and and this is going to be great but in reality, it's not really motivation that leads you to success or that leads anybody to success or achieving a goal. It's, it's habits, right? Because I may not want to get up and run in the morning. I may not be motivated at all. But if I have the ingrained habit of doing that, I'm going to get it done. If I, if I make it easy for myself. Um, if I put my shoes right next to my bed and I put my, my running um, gear right next to my bed so I literally can't get out of bed without tripping on it, that builds the habit of, okay, this is what I'm going to do first thing in the morning. And that will lead me to my goal, uh, my ultimate goal. I do have a goal of running a half marathon this year. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm working towards it. And I'm trying, I'm trying my best to build those habits. So that way it just becomes part of my day, whether I really feel like it that morning or not. Because I will say, there have been plenty of mornings when I've had no motivation to do it whatsoever. But because everything was laid out, because I set things up in a certain way, I did it. So when we want to build healthy habits um, for ourselves or for our young adults, 
um, just start with something really easy, something so small, whether it is um, putting out your toothbrush and toothpaste right um, you know, in the front of the sink, so that way um, your, your child, your student, will have to look at it first thing in the morning. Um, whether that is getting a laundry sorter so that as soon as they take their clothes off, they can put the lights in one bin and the darks in another to start to build those habits of taking care of their laundry and their clothes. Um, whatever it is, start with something really easy. Um, set yourself up for success so you have the tools. You're not kind of fumbling around looking for different things. It's, it's really um, right in front of you and it's easily manageable. And then the third thing, and this is something that um, I think can get lost a little bit, is to make a plan for failure. Um, no matter what you're trying to achieve, no matter what goal you're working towards, at some point, things are not gonna go the way that you thought that they would. Not, it's never like a straight line, right? To, to success, it kind of goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, so when you do fail, and I use that term in, in the best possible way, but when you aren't successful, um, when you do encounter stumbling blocks or roadblocks, what are you going to do? Um, because sometimes things can be going really, really great, but uh-oh, you know, something happens. I had a stress, fractu a stress fracture in my ankle. Oh my God. Okay, now does the whole thing stop? Does my whole entire goal stop? Will I let this derail me? And it's really hard sometimes to say, well, you know what, if I do get injured, I'm going to have to take, you know, several weeks off. I'm going to have to, you know, take this medication or I'm going to have to do these treatments, these stretches, whatever it may be. Um, but what are you going to do if things don't go exactly? as planned. I could, I could call my mom if I'm feeling down, you know, whatever it is, make a plan for what will um, be helpful if things don't go exactly right. And, and this is life, right? I mean, we're all seeing how unbelievably unpredictable life is right now. Um, so if things don't go quite right, have a plan, have an idea, talk it over with your child. If they do encounter difficulty, what is going to be like the first step that they'll do? Um, you know, maybe that's calling you to kind of vent. Maybe that's calling um, someone at, at a support program if they're in that. It may be um, writing down a list. It may be journaling, whatever it is. Um, just knowing what to do when things don't go right is a big, um, if you have that, you're able to kind of get back in the saddle a little bit quicker. So this is um, something that's so simple, right? But it's something that we have our students do either on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And this goes back to the wants and needs. We have them write it down. I think that it's great to do on a daily basis just because with the week, you know, things can kind of switched up. Sometimes things come up unexpectedly during the day. Um, and of course, you know, that resiliency and kind of that adaptability is certainly important, but write it down. Have your child write down what do they need to do today? So you can make two columns. What do they need to do? And that could be go to class, work on an English assignment, take a shower, and help with the dishes after dinner. It could be something like that. And then that's what they need to do. And sometimes in our heads, it gets really overwhelming where you think, oh my God, I need to do so many things today and there aren't enough hours and I don't know what to do and how am I gonna get it done? And then it turns into this panic situation. But when you write it down and you look at it objectively, oh wait, I only need to do four, I need to do four things today. You know, that, and, and that's that online school, homework, um, taking a shower and helping with chores, whatever that is. So sometimes seeing it written down, it can just help to kind of clarify things. It doesn't feel like, oh my God, I have a hundred things I need to do today. Because a lot of those things that they need to do are actually wants. So then they can fill out in the wants column, well, I want to call my best friend. I want to be this level in Call of Duty or whatever game the kids are all playing these days. Um, I want to take my dog for a walk. I want to watch some videos on YouTube. I want to order milkshakes, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, 
and and they'll see that you know most of what they need most of what they need to do is pretty manageable um given that they have a certain you know time frame to do it in and then the wants it's like oh wait yeah these are all really fun things and that in and of itself can be um a reinforcer so if you have them just write it down either the night before or first thing in the morning, it can really help them see that, oh, wait a second, all the things that I need to do, it's really not that bad. I can totally do this. Okay. And, you know, as we talk about managing time, sleep is a big thing that our students sometimes struggle with. Sometimes they're sleeping too much. Sometimes they're sleeping too little. And a big, big um, stumbling block is um, in an unstable sleep schedule. So they might be sleeping at two or three o'clock in the morning because they're up playing video games, they're up talking to friends, they're up um, participating in some hobby or, or whatever it is. Um, and then, oops, they sleep until noon and they've already missed half the day and they've already missed a class, two sessions at CLE, you know, whatever it is. The sleep schedule is so, so, so important. We want our students to be well rested. We want them to have mental clarity. That's incredibly difficult when you're exhausted. Um, so, so also when students have breaks throughout their day, sometimes they say, oh, well, I'm just gonna, just gonna lay down. I'm just gonna, just, I'm just gonna rest a little bit. And that turns into a four hour nap. Um, now, I think we, we may all be guilty of this every so often, but again, this really impacts what they're able to get done during the day and it impacts later on, right? Because if they take a, a long nap from like 2 to 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., they're probably not going to be ready to sleep until 2 or 3 in the morning and, and this cycle perpetuates and it's so difficult. So um, that's something to take a look at um, and to think about um, if your child is sleeping well, do they have a regular bedtime? Do they have a regular time that they get up? Um, there are plenty of apps out there, and I give some resources towards the end of this that can help them um, relax when it's time to go to bed, when it's time to kind of wind down and, and turn their brain off. Um, and there's a lot of apps to help them manage their time in terms of getting up in the morning and setting task reminders and things like that. But getting enough sleep, getting quality sleep, and being on um, a, a healthy sleep schedule is so incredibly important. Um, otherwise, it's going to impact everything that they do throughout the day and how they spend their free time. Because this free time will then turn into napping time, um, which can be detrimental all the way around. Okay, another thing um, that, that comes up a lot for our students when, they, when it comes to managing their free time is they, they have difficulty with transitions. And I'm sure that this is something that a lot of people talk about. Um, maybe you've worked with your child specifically on this, this issue. Um, but you know, when our students are hanging out in their apartment and they're playing games or they're talking to friends or you know, maybe they're cooking something really good and, and they're really excited about it, whatever they're doing um, in their free time is really fun and they don't, don't wanna stop when it's time to maybe go to an online class, when it's time to work on a school project, when it's time to, um, you know, scrub the bathroom, whatever it is, they, they don't want to stop what they're doing. So um, being able to transition from one task is, to another is a skill that we work with our students on quite a bit. We try to group tasks together. Um, so if it's stuff in the kitchen, we try to have them do everything in the kitchen that they need to do at one time. Um, we try as much as possible to control the environment. Now that can be kind of tricky, um, especially given the um, constraints that we're all under, right? Most colleges, if not all, I would say 98% of them have announced that they will be fully online for the fall. Now that can be a really difficult for any student to try to make their home into school. It's not, you know, when, when they're home, they have this feeling of, hey, this is my house. I can chill you know and they're in bed with their laptop like trying to pay attention but it's really difficult when you're reclining in bed to be in the mode to receive the information to learn to be actively engaged so something that we're doing at CLE for this coming semester is that um, when students have their classes and, and they're all gonna be online classes um, but when they are scheduled for class 
they are going to be doing those classes from our center, from our tutoring rooms. So that way they still have to get up, they still have to get dressed, they still have to brush their teeth, they still have to gather up their materials, their book, their computer, their iPad, whatever they're using. They still have to be at our center on time, just as they would have to be at class on time. And they still have to be actively engaged in their class. And that's a lot easier to do when you're not in bed. <laughs> so that is one way that we are um, kind of battling this problem of the environment um, and, and trying to mi mimic a classroom as much as possible while still keeping them, you know, socially distanced and all of that. But it's, it's making sure that they still have a routine and that they feel it as though they're going to class when, you know, as much as possible. Um, we use timers or visual countdowns a lot with our students. Um, we have clocks up on the wall and they can set it to um, count down to a certain time that they have to be working on something. Um, and after finishing a class or a task, most of our students like to get up, um, stretch, get a glass of water, get a really quick snack, um, whatever it is, and kind of end one thing and then get a breath of fresh air and then come back because that makes them ready to do a different thing. Another thing that we use with our students, um, we use a lot of checklists. Um, our students all in their apartments, they have laminated cleaning checklists. So every week they check off when they do a task that can be very reinforcing and motivating to see that they're checking off everything that they're supposed to do. Another thing that works for some um, students is to have like a finished box or a basket or something, or it could just be a section of their binder or a notebook where everything that they finished, they put in that one place. And by seeing that pile kind of grow, that can be really motivating and very reinforcing as well. Okay, now when we say free time, leisure time, fun time, downtime, whatever it is, um, I think that something that's really important to remember is that leisure time or free time is really important time, right? It's really important to feel as though you have some, some time that you can call your own, that you're kind of the master of your own destiny during those hours and you can do what you want to do. Um, so we certainly don't look at all that white space on a student schedule as anything negative or anything wasted, it's incredibly important. Um, having that balance is incredibly important. Um, so, so we, you know, whatever students want to do during that time, we consider that very important um, for their well-being, their emotional well-being, their mental well-being, physical, um, and we want them to make the most of it doing things that are enjoyable. Some of the benefits of having leisure time or free time to do what they want to do, to do what, you know, kind of makes them happy. Um, they're in a better mood. They have lower stress levels. They learn about themselves um, as people. You know, what, what do I really like? What really speaks to my soul? Um, do I feel, how, how do I feel after I do this activity versus this other activity? Um, they, they really learn a lot about what works for them. They have less boredom. And again, it gives them this feeling of control over their time. They're young adults. That's what we all think of, right? Like, I remember when I was in high school, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait till I get to college. So that way I can do what I want when I want. You know, it was this idea. And of course, it's not really like that. But, you know, we all want this feeling of, you know, I am the master of my destiny. I can make my own decisions about what I do and when I do it. Um, and, and that feeling of control is, is a really big thing. And that's, that's, a, that's a hallmark of adulthood. Um, so having that time and building that time to their schedules gives our students that feeling um, that, that they are, um, that they've, they've kind of made it to adulthood, which is nice. Um, so self-care, I mean, this is something that you hear about all the time and everybody's saying, you know, remember it's so, self-care is so important and it is. And this is, um, again, a way that we can encourage our students to use their downtime or their free time in a way that will be beneficial. So they're not just kind of zoning out, although sometimes zoning out is good too. Um, but we encourage our students to take a walk, take a bath or a shower. Um, sometimes our students will like do an at-home spa day, which is really fun. They can play a game, watch some videos that they like, but that are, are um, also somewhat uh, academic or somewhat informative. Um, so that way they learn 
something while they're doing that, and sometimes just quiet time. Um, our students are usually bombarded by all these different things. There's so much going on in the world, in the news, right? Where we feel like it's an avalanche of sound and visuals and messages and all these different things coming in. And it's so important sometimes just to take quiet time, unplug for half an hour and really just let our brains rest. So these are all really uh, great things that we encourage our students to do during their downtime. And then there's doing nothing, right? So if somebody says, hey, what, did you, what were you doing this afternoon? And if somebody says, oh, I was doing nothing, kind of automatically, is that a more positive connotation or negative, do you think? I think for a lot of people, doing nothing sounds like, oh my God, you're so lazy. You were doing nothing? Really? You know, when sometimes that is just what the doctor ordered. Um, sometimes relaxing, you can call it meditating, you can call it daydreaming, you can call it whatever, <laughs> whatever term works, but sometimes that is actually a really, really great way to spend some downtime. Um, because again, it's that disconnecting from all the messages and and all of the different videos that we're exposed to and the social media scrolling and and all of the sounds and everything sometimes doing nothing really really can help more than anything to get some clarity so when our students say i just want to do nothing for an hour we say okay okay that means doing nothing that means like not being on your phone not being on your ipad whatever it is like just Let's just do nothing. And they come back from that a lot of times very refreshed, um, a little bit clearer, more energized, and they're ready to kind of tackle the rest of their day. Okay, so um, I know that I am coming up on my time here. So I just wanted to um, give a couple of resources and I'm happy, um, Judy, I don't know if you can send out the presentation afterwards or I'm happy to if anybody yeah. wants it. Uh just my two cents, uh, we did send it out ahead of time to those that executed a liability waiver. Those that didn't can do that. And I will be happy as a positive reinforcement to send them your presentation. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, so that way um, you don't have to worry about writing this down or anything like that. Um, but there are some really good apps out there um, that help when it comes to tasks and routines. and even um, things that they need to do, such as taking medication. There's a really great app that all of our students use called MediSafe um, and getting them in the habit of managing their own medication and remembering to take that can be really, really great and give them that sense of accomplishment. So um, I won't go through all of these, but, but just know that there is pretty much an app out there for anything that you want or need. There are so many um, with all different styles, all different interfaces, and um, you'll, you'll be able to find one that works for you and your child. Um, to either maintain focus, transition, keep their calendar, know what their schedule is. Um, the most important thing is whatever works for your child, let them do it, right? So you want to kind of pull away from you being the one to shake them out of bed every morning. Um, you know, you want to kind of pull away from the constant reminders, maybe, or the prompting that you have to give your child. Little by little by little, transfer that ownership of certain tasks over to them um, to help prepare them for young adulthood. Hi, hello everybody. So this is a presentation I actually did in Nashville, the up and coming city for kids with the ASD diagnosis. And I was at the College Autism Network uh, um, conference. And uh, it's interesting because the first center, it was at Vanderbilt, and the first center is doing an amazing amount of interesting things with uh, kids on the spectrum. So it doesn't surprise me that CLE has, uh, is starting a site there. Um, now, when we talk about kids on the spectrum, we can be talking about a whole myriad of people because it's a spectrum. So you can have everybody from the child that is um, nonverbal 
to the professor that you had with not a lot of great social cognition skills, but he was really hyper focusing on his dissertation and was amazing in whatever he was teaching you. So I'm not sure what resonates with you and what resonates where your student is, but if this doesn't really connect with you or your student, um, maybe it connects with somebody else that you know. Uh, I, when I work at the College Blueprint, and also the UCI Child Development School is now the children's school. They opened the first year with uh, the joy of having COVID, but um, they're, they're continuing on. Um, so this is uh, just a presentation I did, and I sort of will sort of move through some of it quickly. So moving on. Um, okay. Um, I'm just trying to think how I can... I have all of you in the, on the side here. Oh, I'll, I'll just manage. Um, what happens when uh, you are thinking about going to college or your parents have thought that you should be going to college and it's not really working well? Especially in a place like Orange County where everybody pretty much when they are doing their Lamaze classes, they're already looking at the common app for what their child is gonna do in the future. So. This is something I was hired to do uh, at the uh, College Blueprint, basically, is work with students who were challenged. And uh, many of them, I have kids um, all over in all sorts of colleges, actually all over the world, because if, uh, well, we'll talk about that, but basically a lot, of, a lot of portals are now virtual, and so you can sort of know what anybody is doing without ever listening to them, believing them, or having a conversation just by looking at their portal and seeing what's been submitted and what their real-time GPA is. Uh, but I also had a lot of students that I felt like they were a round peg in a square hole and they kept getting chafed because they were in the wrong place. And in, in ed therapy, we talk about goodness of fit. It's not like I am against college. I come from a whole line of people who teach in college and work in colleges, but um, I don't think it is necessarily for everybody. And it has no concept at all or no thought to how intelligent somebody is. It's much more if it's a good fit for the goals of college. So the presentation is going to focus on when college might not be a right path, the benefits of attending a professional school or certificate program in a professional school, managing parent and community expectations because parents live in communities and so a lot of times even if the parent is saying one thing, the community could be saying something completely different. Community may meaning maybe their friends, uh, their grandparents, the uh, churches or synagogues they belong to, all these other things that make up the student and their community. A scaling a career up or down, key factors in successful in employment and keeping the goal of college alive. So starting, um, uh, you have to do all of these learning outcomes when you do a presentation at a university, they're very funny about that. But I want to be able to, to, to explain to you when you can recognize a student who's not, not a good fit for traditional education and describe the process of transitioning a student from college to a professional school, managing, managing parental and familial expectations, and justifying to the student and the family when alternative planning is appropriate. So I look, at, and I don't play tennis at all, but I look at, at school a little bit like a tennis game. And I always found my students were sitting there in, in the front of, their, uh, of the net with the tennis racket ready to go. And they kept getting balls swung at them and they'd look at back at them and go, oh, that ball went by and that ball went by. Those, those balls being their homework, their assignments, their, their uh, group projects, whatever. There was a real difficulty in keeping up with the amount of work, the pace of work that was going on in college. In some high schools, the same thing, because many times the pace of work is much quicker and faster uh, than a student can handle, but it's dictated a great deal by the intellectual ability of a student. And we have many students, I've worked, some of the smartest kids I have are kids who are on the spectrum, and they are just really great at hyper-focusing, like nobody's business on all sorts of minutiae that everybody else would have forgotten about years ago. Um, but the pace of the work then becomes faster because the sophistication of the assignments and the classes they're in becomes more sophisticated, and that's sometimes not a a good fit either. So um, again, and I've had a lot of experience. I spent nine years in a classroom in a junior high at the Prentice School and then 12 years running um, uh, the school 
at running the junior high and the high school, which is where I met my boss, Jan Kirshner, from the College Blueprint. She did pro bono work for us, and when I left, she said, take a job with me. So that's why I sort of ended up in a college counseling place. So as an educational therapist, I work in case management, finding the right school setting, supporting the admissions process, and creating a team of allied professionals to best support the student. Allied professionals is a really good way of just saying the psychologist, the psychiatrist. Um, sometimes I've worked in double-gated communities. They do exist in Irvine and Newport Post believe it or not. And I will be, I feel like I'm the conductor of a whole slew of professionals, tutors, and uh, coaches for this one student because the, it takes a village basically to get this kid from point A to point B, which makes me think maybe we need to look at another point B. Um, and as an academic coach, I, as I was just saying before, I, if I get a release of information form, if the school is uh, UCI or Chapman or IBC or Saddleback, I will waddle over to the Disability Services Center with the student and actually watch them sign their life away to me so that I can be a release to talk to teachers. I get their username, I get their password, all of their usernames, all of their passwords. Sometimes they have usernames and passwords they don't even know they need. And then I also make sure I've for some reason or another have looked at either their testing or I do informal testing to get a present level of functioning. So I can also see what's going on. Now Melinda in a really great presentation was talking about motivation. But motivation, I think of the Rick Lavoy film, Fat City, if those of you have seen that, and he was a really good educator who did a whole series of PBS films. And he talks about motivation is sometimes a tricky thing because if I gave you a hundred dollar bill, as he said to you and said, I will give you this hundred dollars if you take these three balls and juggle them. If you don't know how to juggle, the motivation is there. You want the hundred dollar bill, but you're not gonna be able to juggle. So I spend less time worrying about motivation and more time worrying about skills because I really do think that most of the time kids are not lazy, they don't procrastinate in a way that because they're lazy and it's not like they lack motivation, but most of the time they lack the skills or strategies or competencies to do what's asked of them to do. So I like to say this little phrase, although most of my students don't drive initially, a lot of times I do help them with the written driver's test, but I like to say you can't get on the freeway if you don't know where the on-ramp is. So my job is to help make sure that you know where the on-ramp is so that you can go flying on the freeway because if you don't, you're just going to go through all those little side streets and as somebody who has the um, directional ability of a kumquat before they had GPS, I was one of those people who could never find the on-ramp. So I'm like their personal GPS and so I think that is a probably a more more strategic way of looking and when kids are not doing what they need to do, if you look at the skill set and you do a task analysis of what's asked of them and they can't do it, then you have a better idea of maybe we shouldn't be asking them to do this, maybe we need to go in another direction to break it down for them so that they will be more successful. So I meet all these lovely little students and they are usually coming to me not because they're dying to meet an educational therapist, but basically they are uh, sort of crashing out of their classes. They are, again, usually feel like they're stupid. I'm sure most of you as parents or students who are on the spectrum have said that. Um, they feel either that or that everybody else around them is stupid for making them do what they have to do. But in any case, usually there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of heightened uh, tension from everybody. So when I look at college and universities, and again, I went to college, I went to graduate school, I taught at colleges. Um, so I'm big on colleges. Uh, my father was a college professor. So my mother was a high school German teacher. My husband is a developmental pediatrician at UCI, which is he's in the Department of Pediatrics in a university. Um, so I am very big on my, I have two daughters, they're both college educated, they both went to graduate school. So it's not like I think college is terrible. I just think that colleges require certain things. They require executive functioning skills and strategies. When we went to high school, everything is organized for us. We have schedule, you usually are going to have an SAI or a resource person, you have an ABA therapist, you've got people, you've got your team, and they're making sure that you are doing what you need to be doing when you're doing it, or they're going to get the wrath of your parents on them. But when you are in college, um, it is sort of like this, this uh, quicksand that right away dissipates when you go to your first job and then all of a sudden you have a schedule again and there are people 
people. You know, when I was the principal of the school, every uh, my teachers had a schedule and I had to do lists for them with due dates up the wazoo. So basically it's that college time that is incredibly different from anything else you have to deal with. It's sort of, they don't do this in a developmentally sound way. That should happen way later. Um, it requires delayed gratification. Most colleges are midterm final experiences. You might take some studio classes. A lot of times I was in the dance department, that's a studio class. You still don't get your grades. You might get a smile from me, but I also could be smiling thinking about something else. So the fact is you're waiting to hear about how things are going and depending on the teacher, you can get very little feed real-time grade feedback until it's almost too late to do anything about it. And it requires taking some courses that you don't really don't hold interest in you. They're, those are the dreaded breadth requirement courses. Cute story on this. Kids always ask me in college who were on the spectrum that an ASD diagnosis, why do I have to take all of these classes? And I'm like, I used to say, well, because when you go to cocktail parties, you have to be able to make really pithy, intelligent, cute conversation about things that will connect to other people. And after the 10th person said, why would I ever go to a cocktail party and make small talk with somebody? I just basically changed it to because that's the requirement of the school. Um, the reality is what I know about kids on the spectrum is what they do well, they really do, and what and they do it really well, and what they don't do well, they don't do. It's a very black and white experience. There isn't a lot of gray there. And so this is a lot of times what shoots kids in the foot is they don't want to take the classes, so they give it very little attention, but you still have to pass those classes to go on to be able to take the classes you want to take, which don't usually happen in, in depth until your junior and senior year. Again, we don't do this probably developmentally sound for soundly for a lot of people. But professional technical schools are real interesting because there's a shorter period of study. All the courses are connected to that topic. If there, and you can get BAs, you can get MAs. You, I mean, there's uh, there's technical schools now. You can even go to community colleges and get BAs. If you want to go further north, there's one. If you're interested in, in bombing and you'd like to start your own funeral home, you can get a BA or BS in funeral science. So there's a lot of places where they really focus on one thing, which for many of our students is fabulous because they're interested in what they're interested in and they're not interested in all that other stuff. A lot of technical and professional schools, which also, if you're thinking, why isn't the lady talking about vocational school? We don't say that anymore. It's not politically correct comment. If they're technical or professional, we don't call them vocational. So I used to get my mouth washed out with soap when I said the V word, so don't say that. So when you're dealing with multi-sensory education, that's how we know most of our students work the best. If it's auditory, kinesthetic, and visual simultaneously, that's a very good way to pull kids into, a, um, into their education, especially if they have a learning disability connected to their um, ASD diagnosis. And I, and we'll talk, I'll talk for two seconds at the end about the conference I'm doing uh, about reading comprehension and autism in April. But um, basically, I find that most kids who are on the spectrum are going to have some, some reading comprehension issues, higher level, higher up, if they're not having it now. They probably decode, probably fine, but their comprehension is is going to be harder because these are kids a lot of times who are very concrete and they're going to be dealing with abstract concepts by the time they're in high education of high school and in, in college and grad school. So, so, we, so this can be a real issue for them. So this is a multi-sensory delivery and also they often work with a cohort that offers supervision and a master schedule. So it's the same group of kids, it's not constantly new people coming in their face because one of the things we know about many kids on the spectrum is that flexibility ain't their main uh, great goal and, and, uh, and um, ability and attribute. So a lot of times to keep a cohort the same. A little bit what we're doing now with coronavirus and not, you know, making sure that kids are, you know, being constantly bombarded by lots of other people. They're looking at putting kids in cohorts so that they can keep the germs together. The cohort aspect is really good for a lot of our students because it keeps them staying the same. There's a supervisor and there's a schedule. So there is a lot more structure. It looks a lot more like high school. So now managing parent expectations. I've got all these great ideas. I'm working with this kid. I'm killing myself and things are just not percolating and they're not working. And it is not like I haven't hit all their executive functioning skills because 
is I'm the person who is their frontal lobe and the frontal lobe is being stretched to their body wherever they are. So it's still not working. And that happens a lot, a lot more than people used to think if you are on the spectrum and you are a bright kid, if you have great, if you can just get those executive functioning skills together, you'll be fine. But that's not always the case. So parents might only focus on what the child wants for career. And this is something, you can kill me for this, but I really believe this. I listen to parents all the time, especially when I was an apprentice. Two things. I want my kid to be happy. I used to say that that's up the, the freeway. It's called Disneyland. We're not unhappy here. We're on competency and building skills. Happiness is a goal that is probably not a smart one to attain because everybody goes in and out of being happy, whatever that is. Um, but another thing is when parents would tell me, I want my child to do what they love doing, I look at them and I say, can you tell me how many adults you know are working in jobs that they love doing? Most of us work in jobs because we've got to pay the rent, we need to eat, we have to have you know a shelter over so we don't get drenching wet. So if neurotypical people much of the time have to go and look at reality and see where their skill set is and where the jobs are, probably a kid who has some challenges might have to also figure that they might have to look at what is out there in the real world. And I'll give you the example. Everybody I know, almost every kid either wants to be a YouTube influencer or a gamer. But when I break down all of the, the skills that you need to be a YouTube influencer or a gamer or anybody who doesn't have a really solid structure and doesn't have supervision, a lot of times these kids are like, and I'll do a, a survey with them uh, just to see where their, their skills are. They don't, they're not so hot in, in being entrepreneurial, taking the lead, calling people up, being incredibly social, or being able to manage a schedule. In fact, while this pandemic has been going on, most of my kids, now they're sick of it. But in the beginning, they were perfectly thrilled to be away from school. And many of them had told, told me, Karen, I've been practicing social distancing my whole life. This is nothing new to me. And, you know, they, I was the one freaking out trying to get help from them. So, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of thing where I think parents have to also realize the world does not change for their child, that their child is going to have to do some movement for the world. And at the end, I'll tell you why I have a very real way of uh, a real uh, experience in what I'm saying. Um, and then fa again, families always fear financially what's going to happen to their kid at, at the end. What am I, what's going to happen when, my, when we're dead? Who's going to be taking care of my kid? Is it going to be their siblings who are going to really love that? Or is it going to be, you know, a, a, you know what's going to happen? And I will tell you, I always tell parents, my goal is for your kid to put you in the good home when you're older, not the bad home. So I'm always looking towards kids living, not living in your back room for the rest of their lives. Okay, so that's where I'm working from, from a personal perspective. So just things to consider. College can be 82% more expensive than community college certificate programs. And in, I have sort of, I just did a, another talk for College Blueprint. I have a few more earlier, uh, later numbers, but in 2015, 45% of college graduates were working in jobs that did not require a college degree. And a lot of times we look at special schools that kids go to when they have learning challenges. And if it's just something where they're going to accommodate for the student, then that's great because the goals are the same as any other student. But if you're modifying the program, then I suggest you take a look at the people that graduated and where they're working and is the money that you're pouring into that education ever going to come out the other end? Because I see a lot of parents put their kids in very expensive programs that don't really teach them to do anything. It's sort of like babysitting or warehousing, hoping that their frontal lobe will connect more and will be more independent. And it might give some, some benefit for that. But at the meantime, skills need to be developed because people don't usually hire you unless you are, you know, the child of them or the niece or nephew of them. People usually hire you so that you can do something for them. It's, it's the whole world of what can we do for you, honey? You have a diagnosis ends in the workplace when you have to then do something for other people. And so how much, how much can you scale that to a kid being independent with some coaching, some onboarding to be able to do that? So when you look at 10 years difference, we always look at the incredible amount of millions of dollars between what kids in college who are college graduates make compared to high school graduates. But there is really not that much data what kids do with college graduation compared to a technical or, 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 um, or uh, 
a, a school that deals with, a, or a program that deals with very specific um, uh, um, skills. And so we find that there is not, when you take a look at the difference in the cost, most people take loans and the difference that you're usually in and out in two years as opposed to four to six years for college. And many of my students go the long route. They take less classes each semester if they are doing four years of college. And so they're not, the, the pacing is easier for them. So it easily is a five or six year experience. You might find that the difference between a technical school and a um, four year college is negligible. So it might not really make that difference at all. So the technical program, students with um, an ASD um, uh, diagnosis often enjoy activities where there's mastery. We've learned that. If you're good at doing something, that's why when kids can master video games, I like video games. When kids can get on their skateboard, I like skateboards. When people are really confident at doing something, they can actually decide that this is really something they're good at doing. Um, and then you, I like to identify jobs that are in demand and hopefully in demand in their area so that they can actually live in some proximity up to their parents because I look at parents a little bit as the uh, steam escape valve in the pressure cooker. You need to sometimes be nearby. Uh, they don't have to necessarily live with you, but they, you know, it's probably better if they're on the same time zone or in a short airplane ride away. Uh, and better if it's in the same time, in the same town. I encourage jobs with schedules that exist and can be modified so that the kid knows what their day is going to look at. So there is what we call the anticipatory set before the day begins, and that there's supervision and it's built in, not snoopervision so somebody is snooping, but real supervision so that you, so somebody is there to help you. Because remember, we talk about kids with ASD as needing social autopsies. They need things at the moment. They're not re really great at delayed uh, feedback because the generalization uh, gene isn't necessarily well developed. And again, I'm doing great generalization in my work with kids with ASD, but I've worked with a lot of kids with ASD. And generally, some of these characteristics, I very rarely see a kid who doesn't have those, those issues, uh, although they do exist. So I'm going to tell you about Robin. Robin is one of the students I got from a referral from uh, a community college, and she had a diagnosis of ASD and LD. She had no real support in public education, and she went to a very good school district, but she was compliant and shy and sweet, and I bet you a lot of teachers basically confused compliant and shy with mastery of skills. She was not a good student, but she sort of eked through with very little um, support from the school, although she did get accommodations. Some she used, some she didn't. And she enrolled in a community college for her AA degree. Her parents were divorced and, at, and not very much on the same page and adamant that she was going to college. And then she was going to um, transfer from her AA degree to a four-year college. And she was going to uh, make something of herself and have a job. And then what we found was that she came to me because she had really poor attendance and she had really low grades from the community college. And she was basically not doing anything. She was uh, uh, sort of not necessarily, she had shut down. I'm not going to say she procrastinated. I'm not going to say she was lazy. I'm not going to make any judgments. I think she didn't have the skills to be in the situation she was in. And she shut down. So, after meeting with her and her parents and realizing that what her parents wanted was probably going to be hard to deliver unless I spent a lot of years with her. Um, and they were, you know, they were putting, giving her to me twice a week and um, they registered, they paid for my services and I got a release from disability services at a community college I love. And I was on speed dial to the professors and the teachers and her parents and we were good to go. And the first thing I had to do was I had to get her to go to school. I had to get her. So this is a problem a lot of times when kids flunk something because they don't show up, then parents just stick them in the next place. But there's nothing that says you're not going to take those same bad skills to the next place because practice makes permanent. You do something long enough, you keep doing it until there's a reason to not do it. So I had to, I said to the parents, do not hold me to any grades that she is going to get, but I guarantee that if she does not go to every class and do all her work by the end of the semester, then just
don't use me anyone, tell me I'm an idiot, and you can just say it was a bad experience, okay? So I gave it my, the old college try, and I made sure that she was going to class, there was accountability, just like you have accountability if you are in your um, book club to all read the book, because you have to talk about it and not sound like a moron, or you have accountability if you have a physical trainer and they make you do all the stuff that you have to do. Why shouldn't we ask kids to, that need accountability to have accountability? So we navigated the college portal. I explained to her how to do it. I could not believe, and I still can't believe how evil some of these college portals are, even high school portals, and how many different professors and high school teachers use different venues to get, you know, they're not all on the same portal. So you pretty much need a PhD to just get through the college portal. But I got through the college portal. We, st we met in the beginning of the week and towards the end of the week, we planned her whole week. I taught her and reinforced activities in active reading and active listening. So she knew how to actively take notes. She knew how to actively go through a text. We went through assistive technologies, so I was not expecting her to use her skills. Even though she could decode, I felt like we just needed to, she was, had a diagnosis of ADHD and we needed to move things um, shorter on. I, it wasn't a formal diagnosis, but I could see she was cognitively exhausted and, and showing those, those signs. Rather, I shouldn't say she had a diagnosis. She was showing uh, a lack of focus by the end of, of uh, a period of work. So I needed to condense it. So we used assistive technology. I monitored her, her use of the writing lab and the tutoring center. I sent emails to her teachers with the questions that she had that she didn't know how to take a interrogative state, uh, statement and make it a declarative statement. She didn't really know how to ask a question. So I, I was her mouthpiece initially. Eventually I faded that so she could do it. And we planned for all her long-term projects and study times for upcoming tests. And I taught her that the deadline triggers the process. So now she is playing tennis with the big guys and she is hitting every ball back, but she didn't have the skills to be able to do really well. And so even though she wasn't flunking anymore and her attendance was there, she wasn't really doing very well because it wasn't a question of her executive functioning skills. You also have to have cognitive skills to do something cognitive like go to college. So uh, next steps, and again, community college doesn't have a lot of wiggle room. If you're doing an AA degree, you're taking a certain amount of classes and that's what you're taking because that's your AA degree, where if you do a four-year college, a lot of times you have more options for how to get those, those uh, breadth requirements met. I met, with the, I met with Robin first, and I met with the parents and Robin. But first I met with her and we role played what she wanted to do. Because halfway through this, I said, Robin, you look like you're having a lot of fun. Are you enjoying this? And she said, no, I hate it. It's a little better than a root canal, but not much. And so I said to her, do you want to do something else? And she said, yes. Well, this kid was always cutting her hair and she had the most wigged out eye makeup I've ever seen and great nails. And I said, you know, you really look like you would probably enjoy cosmetology school. Ever think about that or being an esthetician? She said, I would love to do that, but my mother and father won't hear of that because they want me in college. They don't want me. Now, meanwhile, the person who does my hair is like 25 and just bought a condo. But you know, that's neither here nor there. But I just listened to it. So I said, well, let's let's see what we can do to have a conversation with your parents. You're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but you're not doing it very well. And so it's like getting a job and not getting paid. You're doing all the work, you're not getting the A's. So, and the teachers kept saying to me, this kid really just doesn't have the skill. She's not thinking clearly, she's not writing clearly, she's not getting into the higher levels of, of you know, synthesis and and application that we're expecting college students to do. So um, we determined through screening and all of this that cosmetology was where she wanted to go. So I printed out all of the programs in the area. She did not drive yet, as many of my students don't, but she ha was great at taking her bike and buses and public transportation. I'm, we did work on her. She finally got a learner's permit. Um, but she, I looked at all the private beauty academies. I looked at the certificate programs. And then we had, so I did all the work. I printed everything out. We we had the meeting, the meeting, okay? So uh, with parents, you always are wondering what they're gonna be like when they're hearing stuff they don't wanna hear. But we had it all planned. We had plan A, plan B, and plan C. She expressed that she was not really enjoying community college and she was doing everything she could do. So they couldn't scream at her, you're not showing up, you're not doing your work. And she shared she wanted to be a hairstylist. And I shared with them, she actually has an affinity for this. 
So why can't she do something she's really good at? And what I notice with many kids on the spectrum is the stuff they're really good at, they discount because they look at everything else that's a struggle and think I should be doing that. So I spend a lot of time telling them, you know, other people actually, like I became a dance major in college because I could dance. So other people actually go look at what they're good at doing and do it. It's, it's okay. It's, it's totally fine. So the parents acknowledged that Robin was more present this semester, her attendance was almost perfect, most of her schoolwork had been submitted, and she hadn't missed any assignments. So they really said, okay, I am willing to make this leap of faith to something we don't want to do because she at least is showing she can be a player. And who knows what she could do. Now, she ended up going to Saddleback College, which is number one in California, and I think number 15 in the country for cause cosmetology and it got three different sites. It took us a while to find the correct site. She needed to go part-time. She uh, uh, goes five days a week, but the full-time was making her nuts, so she really needed to go part-time. Uh, she uses all the disability service stuff that they were offering in disability services. Um, she gets to use whenever there's an assessment. We just have to organize that. She uses a smart pen. The classes are small. Much of the delivery is done kinesthetically and she is thriving. And I very, I just really don't see her anymore. She doesn't really need me. She is just on the way. Parents were delighted because she can actually do something now. Um, now we can adjust the outcome. She has to do the licensing exam, but you can take that a gazillion times. So. This is what I like about when I think about kids with ASD. You've got to be able to scale up or scale down with a lot of students. So she could work in a high-end salon, but probably she would need to have some really great cognitive ability as far as, I mean, social cognition to be able to, to have the conversation, you know, be able to fit in, do all of the things that you need to do when you're talking and really pulling in high-paying high clients. She could work at Walmart. I went to Rhode Island with my husband. His mother lives in Rhode Island in a nurse, in a assisted living home. They don't call them nursing homes anymore. And she gets her hair cut for like $6. And Walmart, it's like one $6 haircut after another. I don't think they necessarily spend a lot of time or you don't do cutting edge, no pun intended, haircuts. But again, there are people who are cutting hair in Walmart and they're making a living. So maybe that would be a place for her. Funeral director. They all have people on speed dial who do cosmetology and all of that stuff, and those the clients are dead. So really, you don't really have to spend a lot of time making small talk. She could work in an assisted living establishment, and that's what she really liked. She liked gerontology, and she liked el the elderly, and she liked volunteering. So we were thinking, how could she do that and work and work with, with older people and do their hair? And that was something she really loved because the older people guided the conversation, and she liked to live and she liked to be connected. And then also you can always add barbering or an esthetician program and the more she, and she's saying I'm gung-ho on this stuff I love it and so she's thinking of going on. Now um, the hope for the future I don't want to ever tell people they can't go to college. I've had more students that gave me gray hairs at Prentice that are now red um, that actually went to technical schools and then went back. I have a student who was is a sous chef for a very high end, he went to the Culinary Institute in San Francisco after he bailed out of college because he didn't want to be there and his parents insisted. He went there, he earned six figures as a chef. I have another student who works on the NASCAR route as a welder. And a lot of these people go back to college, both of them for business degrees or they're doing marketing because now they have something concrete to pair something more abstract like a college education with. Things to consider. Okay, if you're making a shift from a professional or a technical program, if you're shifting to that, um, things that are really important are time management, organization, goal-directed persistence, and self-regulation. A lot of my students are not really big on any of those executive functioning strategies. And so when they are going to a professional school, a lot of those things are embedded in the education, so it's taken care of anyhow for them. And I love this quote. Success is achieved by developing our strengths, not by eliminating our weaknesses. So instead of focusing on everything a kid can't do for four years of college, why don't we let them focus on the things they can do? And then basically we don't have to, um, you know, they, then the glass is more than half full. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you about the reason that I talk about these things. This is my family, okay? I have a daughter and a son-in-law and two grandkids, and that daughter is a lawyer. 
who actually does special needs trusts. Um, but the other daughter who's on the side, who's now lost a lot of weight because she went on a radical diet, is my daughter who is 34, who is on the spectrum. And so for 34 years, although I didn't probably know about it till she was about four years old or five years old, so I've had a lot of experience being the mom of a kid on the spectrum. And that kid went to college and she went to graduate school. She went to college, she needed a lot. I mean, I probably would have done it completely different had I known what I know now. Um, but she did go to a small college and she majored in English and she really was a concrete thinker in abstract thought. So she went to graduate school in library science and she is a librarian in one of the county libraries. She's been there for, this is going on, I think, think her sixth year. And she, um, she lives, in, uh, she doesn't live in our house, she lives four miles away in a condo. She goes to work, she gets benefits, she has a social life, she has friends, she drives her car back and forth here, she drives all over creation actually. And basically what I have learned is that when she started working, the world did not change because my daughter had a diagnosis of ASD. They expected what could she do for them. And the more she could do for them, the more she was marketable. So we just had to keep doing a lot of what I do now for other students. I just sort of had to figure out on the fly. And a lot of the things, my husband is a developmental pediatrician who works at the UCI Autism Center, um, he has to figure it out. So a lot of this is born from real life experience and we're still figuring it out. But that kid I know when we're no longer here will be able to take care of herself. And it wasn't that I asked her, honey, what do you wanna be when you grow up? It's like, what can you do? What is your competency? She liked to read. And so that's how I got involved in Prentice. She learned how to read at the Prentice School, but she liked to read and she likes order and she likes systems. And she actually enjoyed the library a whole lot when it was closed to patrons because <laughs> she could do her thing. And she's actually in a post-grad program now to become an archivist from Cal State San Jose. She's almost finished. And her whole job idea is to move to the college level and work with within more resource more uh, support for for college and grad students because that's the kind of stuff she likes the best she knows there's very little unpredictable stuff she didn't say please let me be in the children's library section she's very happy to be in a place where there is support people understand her and so I know what it's like to be the parent of um, a kid on the spectrum it's a club that a bunch of us are in i'm sure if we could choose the club we pick another club but you're in there but the whole idea is you really have to constantly look at what you're seeing and what the task analysis is and what's asked what they're being asked to do and that's where you can contact me so uh, should i stop sharing my screen sure Th thanks karen Oh, you are Sorry. welcome. Oh, and I wanted to just say that I will also be, um, I am on the Tri-County branch of the International Dyslexia Association, and we had to postpone our conference, but we will be doing a conference, God willing, that we are all able to walk around the universe again. It will be April 10th at the Prentice School, and it is going to be really on reading comprehension and autism, and I'm bringing in Peter Mundy mm. from UC Davis. And he's also the, in the Mind Institute in Sacramento. And he's gonna be talking about reading comprehension, theory of mind, and we'll have breakout sessions. And for parents, one of my best pals, Davi Monkar, she's a psychologist. He will, in fact, that's his wife there, but I just hung her up on her. He will um, be talking, to, working with the parents. We will have Judy Mon Montgomery, who's a, used to be the head of speech at Chapman, working with speech pathologists. You will have Peter working with uh, developmental pediatricians and psychologists. And we will have all educators working with Ruth, Ruth Bass, who is another speech pathologist. So I, um, I hope that you can come. I will send information to Judy so she can pass it on to all of you. I will, I will be happy to pass it on. So that was a lot of information. Um, and I know a number of you actually have kids who completed college or, or completed it yourself, um, but I wanted to see if you guys had any questions for either Karen or Melinda, so please use the chat function. While you guys are thinking of that, I, I just wrote Josh's story, but Josh just graduated he graduated, it took him 10 years. Half of that was at um, Irvine Valley College. And he, like Karen, started off as a dance major because that was the only thing I could 
think that he would do at the time. He was really good at hip hop and very into that. And he was not gonna, he was so burned out from school after high school. And then he ended up being a film major and completed at Cal State Fullerton. But I gotta say, Karen, that we were, I call it, um, surrounded by a cocoon of support. And he made it through, he did well, but he needed a lot of help along the way and um, wasn't cheap, but you know, I'm proud of him and you know, he accomplished it on his own, but it's different for everyone. It so really, one kid with autism, you meet one kid with autism. It is different for every single student. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I still don't see any questions, but I'd like to have Ken and Kenny talk. Kenny just completed a degree at UC Riverside in um, business statistics, and he's currently working on, I think, a CPA. So, Ken and Kenny, you want to take yourself off mute and, and kind of share your story? Did anything that either Karen or Melinda share uh, resonate with you? Um, well, I enjoyed both presentations. I learned a lot. Um, but I agreed with a lot of Karen's thoughts about college. So, yeah, maybe Kenny, uh, turn yours down a little bit and then you can talk. Is that okay? Um, I'm still echoing, I think. Okay. No, you're um, fine. You're fine now. Okay. Um, so I always encourage Kenny, and he has this predilection to, <laughs> I really appreciate what Karen said. It's, you know, I encouraged him to get practical interests. So bottom line, he, he likes numbers and I encouraged him to major in business and accounting. So he did that and it's pretty structured and he did well at both Saddleback and UC Riverside. In fact, since he graduated with COVID, he's been taking, I think he, he just got an accounting certificate from Saddleback. Do you think he's, by next fall, he'll take every class in accounting. He's gotten a few internships. Uh, he helps Judy, you know, a little bit with um, the treasure. But, you know, now my focus, and Kenny can talk how, how he wants, is, you know, developing the, um, you know, social skills to do well in interviews and, and things like that. I, I mean, credential wise, and, and, you know, we've had job evaluations. I think he'll be a great worker, but he's not gonna play office politics. He's gonna get the task done. So just figuring out how we convince employers that that's valuable is good. I mean, he may have a job with the census temporarily in a few weeks. You know, he's had a, um, an internship or two. Um, and, you know, Judy, um, also uh, we talked to the UCLA peers to college, college mm -hmm. to jobs. And so he's going to have an intake interview with them in August. But it's just okay. really putting his education together. I mean, he's a very, pra you know, with the job market. So I'm sorry for talking so long. No, you no, say no, that's thing? okay. I, I muted I muted Kenny if he wants to add anything. Okay, I'll mute myself then. And okay, so. Kenny, did you want to add anything to what your dad said? So uh, while I'm gonna move on, then um, so there's a question for you, Karen. It says, my daughter, this is from Nancy Shepard. Hi, Nancy. My daughter is a high school junior and is in need of assistance in assessing what she even wants to do. Is the college blueprint a place that may help her? I need to mention her diagnosis of ASD, ADHD, and she has receptive and expressive language difficulties. I would like to have help getting her into the most effective place. 
I just met with somebody today on Zoom with my boss who is on the spectrum and um, we were talking about he actually is just somebody who's coasting through community college. So somebody was having this conversation later than high school, but we do work on uh, looking at assessments. We, I just put together that we're going to launch an, an ACT because even though uh, many schools are going test blind or, or test optional, I put together a whole LD program to, to do the ACT test prep that's broken down into shorter segments with a lot more direct um, support. So we really do work with students that need special handling, helping them to identify career paths, what they need to do to get into these schools, um, and then also to do college lists that are appropriate. So you can certainly connect to us at College Blueprint. One thing I was just going to say, Ken, for what you were saying, and it blew me away when I was at the College Autism Network conference at, at Vanderbilt, they're doing amazing work with kids who are on the spectrum, who are college graduates, as far as there's a major companies now, there's lists of them. And what they do is it used to be that they would onboard the kid for the, for the job, but that doesn't always work so well. You really need to onboard the job for the kid. And so what they would do is they really fuse together, um, and there's uh, people who are just, um, uh, I think at Morgan Bank, Chase Morgan is one of them, yeah. Ernst Young is another. They have people who, that's their job. I was having lunch with somebody from New York, and her job is to go around the country finding college graduates with, who are, have an ASD diagnosis and then see if they would be a good fit for their um, for their uh, organization and then they will do all of the coaching curating and everything because what they know is what we know which is this is an untapped great great group of people who are you know like my daughter she can hyper focus with the best of them she doesn't take thousands of lunch breaks and so when she's got to do um, uh, big projects that are time sensitive you give it to her and it's going to get done because she's not going to be like going out every 15 minutes to hit the bathroom or go for coffee she will keep persevering because that is one of the skills that many kids with ASD have is what they're really good at doing they really do well uh, that was all our weird professors right so I would take a look at some of those things UC Riverside actually has the professor her name just um uh, I forget it, but she did Autism Goes to College, that video. And oh, yeah. the one, And so there, there is, I mean, that Riverside is a more, that's where I did my ed therapy. It's a more sensitive, uh, like CSUN, more sensitive school to, to special needs kids. But um, I would take a look, and, and there probably are websites, and that's a really good place to start because they are looking for your son. So well, Judy's might, done a lot of research on, on that, and she's right. worked working with people and companies right. in Orange County. Okay. And I, I know there's probably, there's, I think all of the big four accounting firms have programs right. like you just right. described. Right. But you know, with the COVID, right. and uh, you know, I've been, yeah. yeah. It's tough. This is a tough year. Josh had started an internship at a movie studio and it and the week before COVID hit. So yeah. <laughs> it's not the best year. So anybody else with a question? Um, I know I know Hunter is on the phone and Hunter has a son who had kind of really, really bright kid but had a bad start. And he's kind of restarting. I don't know, Hunter, if you feel like talking about your son. I'm reaching out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he, he hasn't been able to go to school for about 12 years now. He, he had gone to Berkeley right out of high school and um, at that time, he had high-functioning autism, but right away in his first year, he developed a mental illness. And so he really should have been pulled after the first semester, but they cajoled us into staying, have him stay there another semester. And then it really unraveled, and um, he was just off the charts. And so then a couple of years ago, he, he started at Saddleback taking one class a semester. And um, because of the medication he's on to stabilize himself, he's He's really lost his ability to take notes. Um, 
the abstract and um, all that is he can't write papers. He can't do the written assignments. He can do all the concrete assignments. And he's, he's a great reader and he can memorize and recite facts, dates, times, and uh, with the best of them. Um, but as we all know, the majority of college classes now do have the abstract where you have to synthesize and compare and contrast and you have to do interpretation uh, assignments. And um, so he's really struggling. He needs a lot of help in any of those classes for sure. Um, the classes that, that are just read, listen to lectures and take a midterm and a final, he can do well. The only problem there is he, he just can't take the notes. So we're trying to get him into those programs like at Saddleback where they have those note, the technology where using the computer or the laptop where you can type the notes straight into there as you're reading. So that, that may help that problem. Um, but it's a tough, it's a tough challenge to figure out what he can do if a certificate program would be better. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at there. Yeah, it might be good to, to get together with uh, Karen or someone at College Blueprint just to, just to get some other idea, think out of the box in terms of what might be the best, best path because it has been, a, I know it's been such a challenge for you. Yeah, he's 30, 30 32 now. Yeah. Um, anybody else want to, let's see. Oh, here's something from Sandy. And it's about college living experience for, so Melinda, I hope you're still out there. Um, is, the, is the college living experience available in all college locations or just college, colleges near your center? Great question. So we are a center-based model, which means that students can attend any college or university or any program of their choice, but it has to be something that um, they can reasonably get to while they are also um, receiving services at our center. So they do have to attend something that is fairly close by. About half of our students drive, half don't. Um, so we do mobility training and, and all of that to help students get to where they need to go. Um, but again, it has to be logistically feasible. Um, so there, the great thing is that there's really good options in every single one of our locations for pretty much anybody or anything that anybody wants to do. Um, so I would definitely, um, you know, we can talk further about it or I can hook you up with some education options for particular programs of study um, at any of our locations nationwide. It's, uh, is the college living experience available for neurotypical students starting college? Um, I will say this. Um, we do require some sort of a diagnosis. So um, that can be a lot of different things. Now, we are seeing a big upswing in applicants whose primary diagnosis is anxiety or depression. Mm. Um, just because they end up needing the support that we offer. Um, whatever they have in terms of challenges affects them to the point where they really do need our, you know, the services that we provide. Um, so, so we do require some sort of a diagnosis, but you know, if someone can benefit from our services, we are certainly happy to partner with that family and, um, you know, work with them as appropriate. Okay. Um, I'm looking at some of the people, you know, there's some people here today that have kids in high school and, um, you know, high school's not very easy to get through. It's not like college, but there's a lot of social stresses. Uh, they kind of front load the academics. So like the beginning years are really, really tough. And then senior year, you have nothing to do. Karen, do you have any advice for uh, parents of, of teens in college about how they should approach, the, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself when your child was in high school, how to approach those high school years? Um, first of all, there's a lot to do senior year. Senior year, you, you read the world's most depressing literature when, for one <laughs> in your classes and you're trying to get into college or you're trying to make some other plans. Um, and a lot of that isn't in your control uh, unless you're going to community college. Um, 
when you're in high school, high school is about a lot of things. And again, it's really hard to have a conversation with all of you because everybody's kid is different um, and people have different strengths. And what I love to, what I love about kids who are on the spectrum is that a lot of kids can't do anything yet, but they can do it eventually. There's a yet there. And it's really nice working with all different kinds of kids. It's really nice to know that at some point, many, when I look at what my daughter does now, and when I even think about her 10 years ago, when I think about her when she was in high school, oh my gosh. So, you know, a lot of times, the first of all, the frontal lobes are usually developing later, the maturity isn't necessarily the same as their cognitively, uh, as, as their uh, peers who are neurotypical. And um, we still, in high school, you have the expectations of the shoulds. You know, you should be able to do this, you should be able to do that if you've done IEPs with your kids in junior high or high school, should is used a lot. Um, so it's high school can be very difficult for a lot of different reasons. Many of my kids who then started abruptly in March going to school from home felt more comfortable because first of all, there wasn't the stress of navigating yourself just with the myriad of noises and energies that are going on in high school, unless you're in a very small high school. The day is very long. I have a lot of kids who are very artistic and they would have loved to go to a place like OSHA, but can't handle a day until five o'clock. A lot of my students are cognitively more exhausted than their more typical peers. And then they have homework to do. They need to get home at a more decent hour. Um, so high school is a myriad of, of social, decisions, you are worrying, um, if you're at all socially aware, you're worrying about being embarrassed and your reputation. If you're not socially aware, that's probably giving you a whole bunch of other problems. Um, a lot of kids who are in high school are a lot more vulnerable to um, misreading cues or to getting in with, you know, doing the wrong thing and not realizing it. So these are kids that are, you know, in a world where they did well when they were in a class where the teacher was with them all day long and all of a sudden they're changing classes. I was a founding board member of New Vista, which is a school for autism in Laguna Hills. And one of the things when we were starting the school, I said, let's make it uh, from junior high to high school and don't worry about elementary school because at least in elementary school, there's a teacher looking out for them. But where do kids get in trouble? When nobody's watching them, when they change class, when they're getting ready for PE, when they're doing all of those things where the teacher isn't right there. So high school has a lot of obstacles. And I think what I tell parents is worry less about the product and worry more about the process. If the kid isn't getting everything that's going on academically, but they're learning how to be in class, they're learning how to advocate for themselves, they're learning how to coexist with other students, they're learning how to change and be where they need to be, you know, and they're, and they're going through that, then build on that each year. And don't worry so much about the GPA and, and the future because it's probably gonna take a bit longer. It's taking a bit, this is an immature group of kids who are neurotypical. How many kids are not driving now that should be driving? How many kids are not doing anything independently that should be because they're not gonna bother with it because everything they have is in their home. So I just think our neurotypical students, and I work with them too, I, I can't get over how dependent they are on other people at our age you know as soon as you were a certain age you were out of there and you were on your own and that's changed for everybody so it's, it's particularly uh i see it particularly present with uh students who are on the spectrum but if you can give them as many life experiences as possible realizing that the generalization will take longer and that many of our students need to they're not necessarily a great really great in self-awareness and insight and flexibility so they need more and more of these experiences where you know when when they don't do well what um, melissa melinda called failure or let's say challenged or let's say obstacles they cannot you know get through if we really can do something that i like which is plan B and I think about it as um, actually closure to something and, and evaluating before that's good teaching before you go on to the next thing if students can process the things that went well and tell you what went well so they can replicate it and what didn't go well and then you can help them find other ways to get around it then eventually they will realize that it's okay that's the thing I find the, the most about high school kids on the spectrum is that if they're like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and they'll keep beating on that wall, never looking for the door, never looking for the window to get out because having to have another plan is really 
anxiety producing and stressful and says something about their competency skill. And if you can teach them, I, I need another plan and it's okay because this isn't working and, and you show them your other plan. I have my kids all the time help me do Lamont's breathing as in Zoom, I switch to share a screen and for a second, they disappear. Are you still there? Have I lost you? And it's taken me, I tell them, I'm like totally freaked by this stuff. They're totally digital natives and they love it. And so if we can share the fact that it's a process much more, and the process for kids on the spectrum, I think is much more important than the product because the product will always change. But if you can get confident in your process, you will be able to keep moving forward. So that's what I would have told myself when I had my daughter at a, in high school is would you just think about the really important stuff and don't stress out about all the other stuff because it doesn't really matter as much as you think it does it's a long answer good. a short question it's good. it's good advice i think a couple points of that is when these kids develop and grow and so whatever they look like in high school or whatever they look like in elementary school they're going to become more mature, more independent. If you care and take, you know, if, if you know, if, assuming some tragic thing doesn't happen, but so, so take good care of them and they will uh, grow. And so what you're seeing maybe in high school isn't necessarily what you're going to be seeing 10 years from now. So I think that's a, a really good point. Um, and I think managing that anxiety is also a really good point because what I see a lot from these kids is is anxiety is is um, not you know maybe they're one of the kids that came to a session last weekend was concerned about perfectionism and having everything be perfect and that was stressing him out or maybe some of the points that I think I, I'd like to have maybe um, Melinda talk a little bit about dealing with anxiety because I'm sure she sees a lot of that so that might be interesting but I think those are good points. Hey Melinda do you want to talk a little bit about anxiety and and um, and what you see at College Living Experience how you guys work uh, through that? Yeah absolutely I mean that is definitely a huge a huge thing um, that most of our students deal with no matter what their primary diagnosis is um, you know a lot of them really want to do well um, it, and they they want to be successful they want to show everybody what you know what they're capable of um, you know sometimes we find that the anxiety it it can prompt several responses and I'm sure that you guys are you know have seen this too where sometimes they're overly um, focused on perfectionism and sometimes they're almost you know kind of inanimate um, where it, it's very paralyzing um, so we have various strategies that we use and that we um, you know uh, try to employ and, and different things work for different people um, but in general anxiety is something that I would say we see in about 90% of the students in our program in addition to whatever their primary diagnosis is. Could I jump in about kids who are perfectionists where a lot of times the diagnosis is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder? A lot of times people who show those symptoms, it's because they're controlling the rate and pace of the work. So if, I, if everything, I always like to say to the kids, just paint the ceiling white. It does not need to be the Sistine Chapel, but they need to make it the Sistine Chapel because then they can really limit and it's like a trickle of work coming out as opposed to a big full onslaught of the faucet being open and the spigot running. And so I find that when you really get to the root of why things have to be so perfect, a lot of times, it, I, I used to see that when I taught and everybody numbered their paper and the kids that had to get the numbers correct and they, they're saying, slow it down, lady, I can't go this fast. So it has to be a certain way so that I have some control of the situation. And a lot of times students with these issues really need to be, and that's another thing is to have a really good therapist on speed dial for your kid. And the therapist has to keep changing as the needs change for the child. Very rarely do I find somebody who, I mean, you're going to see, have Chelsea O'Hare in a couple of months talking. And I used to work with her at uh, the Child Development School. She's amazing. But very rarely do you find somebody who can take the lifespan of your kid because your kid will present with different issues at different times. But a lot of times a good therapist who understands kids who are on the spectrum can really get 
get to a lot of the things that people who aren't don't have that training or parents can't do. And that has been another thing that has been the lifeblood of my own experiences finding good therapists. I, I would agree with you is, is that that's been the cornerstone to just have that regular relationship with a good therapist. Not easy to find. And I know that we get some that have concerns about um, insurance and all, but it, it, it really helps. Uh, there, there's a really good question here. Um, about units. Uh, this is from Martin. Is it, is it possible common for folks on the spectrum to request and be granted a reduced class load when attending a regular four-year college should the need arise and at the same time allow to retain academic scholarships? I don't know about the academic scholarship, but it's certainly possible. Uh, that's uh, in many of the schools that have tier three or tier two programs, higher level programs for support, they will work with you so that you're taking classes in the summer or that you're going for an extra year. Sometimes I tell parents when they're planning in high school, you might want to think about the college your kid is going to. If you feel that your child really needs to cut the, the class size down to something more manageable, maybe they need to be in a school where they don't have to worry about getting a dorm after a year or two and they can easily live in the town. Or maybe you need to go to some place where the tuition isn't so expensive because some schools really want you in and out in four years. They don't have the dorm room for you and you're gonna be paying the same freight whether you're doing four credits or six credits, uh, four classes or six classes. So I think that if you feel that your child might need to be able to slow down the pace, which for a lot of kids is wonderful and makes them a lot less stressed and they do a much better job, then basically you might be looking at uh, that might influence the choice that you make for college. And some students will need to take classes that are um, sort of supportive classes. Community colleges do it all the time. If you're not able to do, you know, the math classes that are required for the AA and you're taking classes that are supporting those skills, they're not even counted for college. So some students will come in for a whole semester, which doesn't count really for anything. Maybe it'll count for one class because they're taking um, resource classes to support the, the college classes that they're going to be taking. So all of these things, and you've got to look at finances, you've got to look at living experiences, you've got to look at commute time. I have tons, I could do a whole lecture for you on kids to do, um, and um, Melinda, you probably have had the same experience. People who do, they say, my kid isn't going to live on campus. They're going to commute. So I said, have you looked at the tasks, the skills? Have you done a task analysis of the skills you need to commute? Have to have gas or a powered up car. You have to have all your materials. You have to have money or something for lunch. You have to be able to, like at UCI, the most stressful experience of the whole university is finding parking. It's not finals, it's parking. You have to, I mean, there's a lot of executive functioning skills to being a commuting student. And plus, a lot of times they feel like they're still in high school because it doesn't really have the socialization that living on campus is. And my daughter was an executive functioning income poop, so she went to a four-year college where she lived in the dorms because I knew she could roll out of bed and get to a class. I had no faith that she could ever get herself from point A to point B when she was a freshman in college. So I, it really is, you have, everybody is different, but you really need to look at the skills your kid has and then see what's around. You can certainly just slow down college, but you, I don't know about the scholarships. I imagine if you make a case for why that's important, you have a fighting chance for that, but I don't know. My experience is you can take, you know, fewer classes at like Cal State, that wasn't a problem. Um, but every once in a while, you, you bump into something that requires that 12 units. So you, you may run into it with the um, uh, Department of Rehab or something like that, but they're starting to make accommodations there. So we just have really one more minute. I think I'll just take this time to thank Melinda and Karen for a, hopefully it was a, educational session on education and I'd like to thank all of you for attending and I noticed a few people were kind enough to execute the liability waiver when we were in here so that's great and um, we've got a lot of activities coming up this next week so uh, keep your eye on your email and thank you again. Uh, this session was recorded and I will be making it available um, in the next day or two. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Oh, thank you. Bye.